Hello, everyone. Welcome to week five of the Octopus Accelerator program. Today, we have the privilege and honor of inviting Mr. Nizam, CEO of Ethicom Consulting. Nizam, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Wuri, uh, for having me on board of your program. Um, and hi, everyone. It's good to virtually meet all, all of you. Uh, my name is Nizam. I'm the CEO of Ethicom Consultancy. We are a Singapore-based compliance consultancy. Uh, we work a lot with blockchain, uh, fintech firms, and, and cryptocurrency uh, platforms. Um, as for myself, I used to be a regulator with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Um, I also used to head up compliance in banks uh, in Singapore, uh, yeah, most of my investment banks. Um, I used to also head up uh, uh, the financial services practice within a law firm. So we've formed Ethicom slightly more than two years ago and we're active in the blockchain space and uh, very glad to be here. I've been asked to talk about uh, innovation, regulations, uh, how it impacts uh, the crypto space. So let, let me just jump into it. So let's go on to the next slide. Oh God. Sorry, give me one second. This okay. Okay, got it now. Um, well, um, I've been told there are three realities in life. Uh, one is death and taxes, and there's nothing that I can help you on 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 those matters. But the third one, the third reality is more regulations, um, and that is particularly true in the crypto and the blockchain space. So I'll talk about that in a bit. And here's another reality that. Uh, Financial services, so particularly if you're looking at setting up something like an exchange, a trading platform, um, or even some DeFi projects um, that touch upon financial services. So financial services is the most heavily regulated industry in the world. So that's another reality. Um, and of course, when regulators talk about regulations, there's always a tension between regulations on the one hand and promoting innovation on the other. Um, so this is uh, Mr. Ravi Menon. He's the managing director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And this was him making a statement at uh, uh, the FinTech Festival in Singapore. It's a great event. Um, so this was a few years ago, but I think what he says remains valid till today. Um, and this is on regulations and innovation. Now the critique is that regulators tend to lag behind innovation. But what Ravi Menon says is this, that he says reg the, reg the regulator must run alongside innovation, alongside innovation, not lag behind it. Uh, of course, it is impossible for regulations to move ahead of innovation. Um, I think that will not be wise because um, you really don't know how a new practice would evolve in a certain way. Um, so I think DeFi is a very good example. Um, I think regulators are looking at it cautiously and I think the mistake they would make is to front run it, move ahead of it. Um, but he says a few important things as well, that um, they must take a risk-focused approach towards regulation. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that in deciding whether or not to regulate a new activity, so regulators must uh, understand the risk that a new activity would present itself uh, to the whole uh, country or, or to the whole geography. So that's one, risk focus. Next, uh, proportionality or being proportionate. So that having identified the risks that you want to regulate, you know, you, you can't use a sledgehammer to kill an ant, right? So you must be proportionate. Um, and that's exactly what he's saying here. He also ended up his speech by saying that we must let a thousand flowers bloom. So that's quite heartening, meaning that you must let the industry grow. You must let innovation happen. Um, and you must let all these new products being offered. But that's a very important caveat. The caveat is it has to be a garden. It can't be a total mess. And I think that's the role of regulators, making sure that you know, the, the, the sum of the innovation that happens brings value rather than uh, you know, one which is destructive. So let's move on. Um, I think it's important also to understand how regulators think. Um, and this, is, this diagram uh, this, that looks like a temple um, is an example of the regulatory philosophy of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So you, you, you can see that right in the apex, that the green triangle at the top, 
it talks about two key objectives. One is a sound financial services sector, and the other one is a progressive financial services sector. So it sort of illustrates the tension between sound and progressive, you know, sound stability, consumer protection, everything, those concepts are there. Whereas progressive denotes innovation, you know, new products being offered, very vibrant, competitive financial services sector. So you have uh, in, in the light green box below the triangle, um, a couple of typical regulatory statements, uh, stable financial system, safe and sound intermediaries, uh, fair efficient markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then uh, you see some pillars, um, and the pillars are some of the things that regulators do, like regulation, authorization, or licensing, supervision, surveillance, and enforcement. Enforcement is where you don't want to get involved in, right? It, it assumes that things have gone wrong. But if you look at the bottom, you know. Uh, a support, this base at the bottom that talks about the principles or the beliefs that underpin the MES's regulatory approach. It mentions a, a few things, risk focus being one of them, as, as what we discussed earlier, that you, know, you don't just regulate for the sake of regulating, you regulate because you want to address specific risks and business friendly. Now, this is the MES's own words. They are by definition, or they want to be business friendly. And, and this is quite interesting coming from a regulator that wants to facilitate the growth of businesses because that's an important part of the ecosystem, right? If there's no business, there's nothing to regulate. It's as simple as that. Now, moving on. So this gentleman is the chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mr. Taman Chanmugaratnam, who's also, well, he was formerly the deputy prime minister in Singapore. He recently stepped down, but he said this about cryptocurrencies. And this was a few years ago, but still very interesting. Now, essentially, he says this, that cryptocurrencies are an experiment. Um, so it's too early to say if they will succeed. And if they do succeed, the implications might not be known for some time. So MES has been studying this uh, for some time. Now as, now, as of now, there's no strong case to ban cryptocurrencies. So this is a few years ago. Obviously, they have come that way. Um, and we will subject those involved as intermediaries to money laundering laws. Okay, We'll talk about that in a bit. And we could, and we'll keep highlighting to Singaporeans they could lose their shares when they invest in crypt, uh, money in cryptocurrency. So this is a fair warning. Yes, they're volatile. You could lose your entire capital if you put money in it. So come in, buyers beware. But the last, uh, the last paragraph is particularly interesting. It says we will continue to encourage experiments within the blockchain space that may involve the use of cryptos, as some of these innovations could be economically or socially useful. So that's. Um, very, very interesting, but we will be uh, stay alert to new risks. So here is the chairman of the regulatory body saying that within the blockchain space, some of these innovations could be economically or socially useful, and they are alive to these uh, benefits that the blockchain can bring. So whilst it was a few years ago, this is hot of the press, well, almost hot of the press. This was about a week ago, you know, um, um, where... Uh, Taman Chamugaranam again said that there is a place for crypto in Singapore if regulated well, right? So the philosophy is there must be clarity in terms of regulation. And then um, we will also uh, be alive to some of the benefits that cryptos can bring. He actually actually spoke about uh, areas such as DeFi and NFTs as well. Uh, so that's, that, that's quite uh, enlightened in my view. And okay. So not surprisingly, there's been a lot of regulatory developments, whether internationally or in Singapore. So these are some of the, uh, this slide tells you about some of the changes that have taken place in Singapore. I'm not going to go through it in detail because there's a lot here. Uh, but if you look around the region, um, you know, five, six years ago, cryptocurrency regulations probably didn't exist. Um, and probably a lot of regulators weren't even thinking about that. Um, but what has happened is that in some, some shape or form, most regulators, uh, even if you look at Southeast Asia, have started introducing licensing regimes for crypto exchanges. That was the first step. Although the approach might be different, right? Because okay, in Singapore, the area I'm most familiar with, so the, the MES has regulated cryptos uh, mostly as digital payment tokens. Um, in Indonesia, the approach is different. They've regulated it as commodities. So if you want to start a crypto exchange, you need to get licensed by the commodities regulator, not the financial services regulator. Up north in Malaysia, 
uh, the regulators have taken an even di a more different approach. They've, they've treated cryptocurrencies as securities. Um, now, that might not seem easy with a lot of people because there are downstream implications. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, Thailand also has got a regime for cryptocurrency licensing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but the point is this. The point is regulations are constantly evolving, right? And the other point is when you do business within Asia, remember that there isn't such a thing as one single Asian license or an ASEAN license or a Southeast Asian license. No, we're far away from that. So we don't have a passporting regime that exists maybe in EU, uh, in the EU. So when you offer your platform in different countries within Southeast Asia, you must conduct your own due diligence to see if you are licensed, whether in Indonesia, in Singapore, or Malaysia, or Thailand, or Vietnam, wherever it is. So every country has its own set of regulations and set of licensing expectations and requirements. Um, and of course, it's something that you should do. I mean, even though the promise of uh, doing things uh, on the web is that, you know, it's supposed to be borderless, but the reality is um, there is still um, local regulations and laws that would apply. And if you get on the wrong side of the law, of course, there are consequences like fines, jail terms, or you could even lose your license and you could be banned from that country, something you don't want to do. Um, so please, um, please be mindful of that, particularly in the countries that you either form a legal entity or in the countries that you want to market into or you know, solicit uh, business from residents. So bear that in mind. But you know, in, in Singapore, so we've seen tremendous amount of regulatory changes since uh, 2017. Um, but of course, there's even before that, there, there were plenty of new regulations governing fintech. But from 2017 onwards, the momentum on cryptos have picked up. So there was a guide uh, to digital token offerings, which gave clarity on when you do an ICO or, or ITO. Uh, there were changes on the recognized market operator regime allowing digital securities or tokenized securities to come about. Uh, and then the MES uh, introduced the Sandbox Express. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, that also helped uh, a, secure, a digital securities exchange to go to market and get to the Sandbox within 21 days uh, under this Express regime. And that's fantastic. Um, and then there's further clarity on stable coins. Um, <laughs> So there was clarity in that uh, they'd be treated as e-money, but there are some restrictions that come along with it, um, so which is uh, unfortunate. Um, and then we had the Payment Services Act. So there was a massive set of new regulations that introduced licensing uh, for crypto exchanges and crypto dealers. Along the way, and within a year of the enactment of the Act, they had an Amendment Act which introduced further changes, and they will now regulate things like custody, uh, as well as uh, crypto custody, as well as uh, other forms of intermediation. So for instance, if I broker a deal, somebody was, wants to sell cryptos, the other person wants to buy it, I, I put them together, I need to be licensed, even if I never touch the cryptos. Um, so anti-money laundering is uh, uh, an area of tremendous change. I think most regulators will, will look at it. So Whatever you do, I think AML and CFT, CFT means combating the financing of terrorism, uh, will be an area of focus. Um, the Financial Action Task Force, and that's the international body that sets global standards for anti-money laundering, have actually just released uh, a set of revised guidance on, uh, they call it virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. So cryptos and cryptocurrency uh, intermediaries essentially. Um, so do look out for it. You, 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 you can Google it and uh, understand it a bit more. Essentially, there's a lot more emphasis on um, crypto intermediaries putting in place a very robust framework for anti-money laundering. Um, in Singapore, we also have got some new regulations on crypto derivatives. So that impacts the approved exchanges, approved securities exchanges, um, but not uh, cryptocurrency uh, platforms. Um, and there is a new Omnibus Act that's being proposed uh, in Singapore as well. Um, and these will regulate cryptocurrency activities uh, done by entities in Singapore, but targeting non-Singapore residents. So plenty of uh, things going on out here, out here, and I think more to come. But remember, we go back to the basic principle. The basic principle that Taman Shamugaratnam said was that there has to be a regulatory clarity. Crypto activities have to be properly regulated, um, but 
you know, uh, the MES will allow it uh, to take place. Okay, moving on. So what are the issues for startups uh, like yourself? Um, so here are some, some key points, right? One is, you know, bearing in mind that there are different legal systems within Southeast Asia, um, you probably will need to be incorporated before you do business. So whether it's Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, wherever it is. But when you do that as well, there are different legal philosophies. So um, what I mean by this, so for instance, in some countries, they might have foreign ownership restrictions. Um, and that might be you know, something that you, you, you need to carefully navigate. Um, or in some countries, uh, a, a non-resident might need to meet certain minimum paid up, paid up capital requirements before you're allowed to incorporate a company, or you might need to, to get a local partner as well. So these are the issues uh, that can come up. So do better in mind. Um, licensing. So the, the broader question for licensing is, of course, if do I need to be licensed to begin with, right? Um, and of course, uh, you need to find out what kind of license that will apply to you, who are the regulators. Um, and, you know, licensing is a double-edged sword, right? So on the one hand, you might think that, okay, it's going to affect my go-to market timeline because I need to apply for a license. It could take me months or in some cases years or more than a year to get a license. But at the same time, it's also a barrier to entry for your competitors. So um, it works both ways. And of course, the other issue for startups is minimum paid up, paid up capital. And that's a function of the license that you need. You, you, you may or may, may not need to apply for. Um, and if you need to be licensed, then of course, uh, the other issue is track record. Because some regulators actually require that the team that promotes the platform must have some form of relevant experience, whether in financial services or you know, in specific activities. Um, there's also typically some requirements or fit and proper requirements. Uh, for instance, if the, one of the founders of the startup or one of the key management person has got a previous criminal conviction, that could be an issue. Or if, if one of the team members is uh, insolvent uh, or are bankrupt, that could also be an issue. Now, in terms of costs uh, for being a licensed entity, there are also compliance costs, um, needing to subscribe for a tax solution to do anti-money laundering and combating or financing terrorism uh, compliance. So uh, whether it's screenings, digital identity verification, transaction monitoring, or even some of the cutting edge, uh, you know, blockchain screening solutions, all these means costs um, um, that you might need to factor in when, when, when you do up your business plan. And of course, risk management, because, uh, you know, whether or not you're in financial services, risk management is, uh, every business is about uh, risk management and putting in place a good framework is, is quite uh, important. Um, so you're a startup and, uh, you know, you might think, okay, you know, uh, I'm a startup, I'm not an established big boy player, but here are some of the things that you might need to know as well. So as I mentioned, the first other question is, ask yourself or ask somebody if you don't know what the answer is, will I need to be regulated, right? And it's, it's good to have that open uh, conversation with a consultant, with a law firm, or with an accounting firm asking, okay, if I want to do this, what are the implications? Do I need to be licensed? What kind of license do I need? Who do I apply uh, uh, the license with? So that's the first order question. The, uh, I mean, we, okay, the, the, the second point is understanding a risk-based approach. So I, I mentioned this earlier on, <clears throat> you're in the business of uh, managing risks, understanding your risks. So, you know, document these risks that will apply to you, uh, assign a risk weightage, low, medium, or high um, in, in your risk register. And also um, that will allow you to set a body of controls or processes that will mitigate against those risks and then find out if there are any residual, residual risks. So, I mean, the whole risk-based uh, approach is very important. Uh, whether or not you are in financial services, so something that you need to pay attention to. So from my dealing with a lot of startups, this is an area that typically they tend to overlook. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, um, AML and CFT is in sharp focus, um, whether or not you're licensed or not, uh, because even if you're not licensed, if unwittingly through a transaction, you help facilitate, <coughs> excuse me, money laundering, that could typically get you into trouble. 
and there's something that you don't want to do. So please bear this in mind. And here are some of the issues um, that could impact a fintech firm. Um, for instance, um, non-face-to-face KYC. Are there many solutions out there that allows you to do to verify that a person is in fact who he or she says he is, uh, whether by way of biometrics, a video or photo analysis, or link to national databases. Um, the other obligation is screening, um, screening of names against databases uh, to look for previous uh, criminal conduct, whether the person's on the sanctions list, uh, looking out for politically exposed persons, higher risk indicators, litigation, bankruptcy, et cetera. Um, you need to also risk assess your customers, whether they're low, medium, high risk. Um, to conduct enhanced due diligence where appropriate. So for instance, if there are any high risk indicators when you conduct your screening, uh, you need to therefore validate um, that the customers are kosher and typically you will ask for source of wealth or source of funds. And next, moving on to uh, transaction monitoring. So this looks at patterns of behavior. So let's say you run an exchange, right? Um, or something like an exchange. Um, you will therefore need to look at patterns of transactions by your customers to look out for changes in behavior um, that could point towards suspicious activities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and of course, we could go on and on, but these, these are the basic obligations that you need to be mindful of. Um, and again, um, for platforms that conduct a lot of the businesses um, using technology, now, a lot of your risks would therefore be uh, shifted within the technology realm, right? And anything can go wrong. So we see that happening with banks, you know, getting hacked or, you know, having outages. Um, and regulators are always very concerned about this. So if you're looking at a blockchain-based solution, chances are technology risk management will be a very key risk for you. Um, so this, these are some of the issues that you should look out for, uh, putting in place a good governance or risk management framework, getting the right people and getting independent bodies or persons uh, to look at your processes, uh, looking at your outsourcing risk, particularly as most of you would, would um, base your businesses on, on a cloud provider. Of course, that means you're outsourcing your service uh, or your, 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 your server locations to, to a cloud provider, and therefore you need to do some due diligence on, on the service provider. There are also other various uh, security requirements and testings, for instance, also a source code review, um, looking into disaster recovery, business continuity, uh, because outages are a fact of life. Um, and penetration testing is also one key area of focus uh, by regulators. So again, something that you should pay particular attention to. So I won't go through the rest. I think it's quite self-explanatory. Now, the other point is this. So even if you don't need to be licensed, and there are many activities there that don't need to be regulated, right? You should, you should put in place a compliance and a risk management framework because ultimately you're talking about the sustainability of your business. Uh, if you're getting shareholder funds, of course, they will be interested to find out that their funds are also protected through a solid risk management and compliance framework. So it's something to bear in mind, definitely. Okay, I'm moving on to, to another issue and I think it might be of interest. And it's the issue of the regulatory sandboxes. Now, in the past, um, if you have a new idea and it doesn't fit nicely within re the regulatory framework, um, you might be stuck because regulators need time to think through how I should regulate you or what kind of licenses are appropriate. Um, and it's, it's, it's a you know, lose-lose situation because they are, they are stuck and you are also stuck because you can't progress and do your business. Now, the, because of these, uh, regulators have created this concept of a regulatory sandbox. Now, it won't, it won't apply to everyone and anyone, but if you have an innovative uh, new platform and you need some form of consultation to the regulators or some discussions as to what is the appropriate regulatory treatment, then a sandbox is a great thing because conceptually, it allows you to go live with your business even before you get licensed. Um, 
And at the same time, there is a discussion with the regulators on putting in place some form of limits uh, to your business. So I'll talk more about this in a bit. So um, we have seen uh, sandboxes, uh, you know, it started with the UK and then Singapore uh, quickly followed suit. Now it's in various places, Australia, Malaysia, Thailand, Hong Kong, and Indonesia, and I'm sure a lot of other uh, countries as well. The whole concept is we will allow, we as the regulators will allow you to experiment with your new business in a controlled environment because there are defined parameters. Uh, there is a defined duration. So you're in a sandbox, say for six months, uh, there could be limits to the number of customers or transaction sizes or transactions volume. And so if, you know, like being in a chemistry uh, laboratory, if there's an explosion that happens, it is a control explosion. So that's the whole philosophy of it. Um, and of course, during the sandbox period, the regulators will come and get to know you. So that's, that's a big plus. Um, and you will set some KPIs for testing. Um, and, you know, the whole concept is risk taking, right? So we always speak about the startup taking risks, but here the regulator is taking risks by allowing you to operate without a license, but subject to certain restrictions. So it's a bit of give and take. So it's, it's really helpful if you are doing something innovative. So innovation will be a very important criteria for you to get admitted into the sandbox. Um, it's great because when you get into the sandbox, um, there is a high chance that you probably would get a license eventually because the regulars get to know you and uh, unless something bad happens during the sandbox period. Um, so it gives your investors confidence that you are likely to get licensed as well. So, right, so investors might also view admission to a sandbox uh, favorably. But of course, you must uh, show uh, innovation. So most regulators would have a very high uh, degree of requirement uh, for the demonstration of innovation. Okay, so that's, that's all the slides I have right now. And uh, Wuri, if you have any questions that you want to ask, I'm happy to take them. Well, thank you so much, Nizam. That's a great framework for all of our startup founders to uh, to consult with. And I'm sure, like when they have, they have way more questions uh, right now. And uh, and I highly encourage everyone in the accelerator program to consider regulation and compliance early on uh, in the startup uh, development stage and uh, engage with a professional like Ethicom as soon as possible uh, if you think. Uh, your, your startup is at that stage. Uh, I do have one question from a participant in the accelerated program, and she wants to know, can a project go through IDO without going through KYC? And what are the potential risks for not doing a KYC? Okay, I would, I would discourage that actually, because um, KYC actually protects you. Uh, because the last thing you want to do is, um, when, you, when you, you issue, whether it's a token or, or something else, um, and without your knowledge, um, the person who, you know, who subscribes to the, to the, the issuance um, turns out to be a criminal. And you know, he gives you a million dollars and in exchange for tokens. And, and of course, he might sell, sell those tokens subsequently. But because you receive the one million dollars and because you've not, not done your due diligence, and he turns out to be a criminal and investigation has started, you're not going to look very good because you have, you have actually facilitated the conversion of ill-gotten gains from one form to another, fiat to tokens. Um, so in that case, you yourself could run into liability. Um, so even if you're not licensed um, for token issuances because, because of the high risk um, of laundering when it comes to conversion of one property from one form to another, please uh, do a AML KYC uh, due diligence because to be honest, right now, there are lots of service providers out there. Yes, it comes with a fee, but that's your insurance policy. Thank you, Nizam. Well, that's uh, the only question I have for now. And uh, we will be discussing compliance throughout this week with our participants. And hopefully we'll see uh, Nizam at our live uh, seminar on Friday. Uh, thank you so much for your time. This is very, very helpful, Nizam. And uh, yeah, thank you. And I'll see you on Friday. Pleasure and all the best.